Greetings and welcome to the ROI Clear podcast. My name is Ray Hightower, and today we are fortunate to have as our guest, Ms. Ramona Westbrook. Ramona Westbrook is president of Brook Architecture. She's an architect and a business leader, an artist. She does so many things so well, and we are fortunate to have her here. Um, well, we've known each other for decades, and I've admired her for all of that time, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Ms. Ramona Westbrook. Welcome, Ramona. Thank you, Raymond. I feel so honored. Like you said, so many nice things about me. Oh, yes. I, <laughs> I, I, I only that. say nice things about thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate In it. All thank of you. the time we've known each other, I've only said nice things about <laughs> you. So. Okay, we're going to keep this moving. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to kick things off, you know, it, it's remarkable. You started your architecture firm back in 1994. And to kick things off, why don't we give our audience an overview of who you are and what you do and frame it this way. You're on an elevator, someone you will influence, perhaps your ideal client. What would you say to that person in terms of an elevator ride? I think I first... I'd acknowledge who he is or who she is, my name, and, and let them know my name's Ramona Westbrook. I am president of um, Brook Architecture. We are a full service architecture firm. We are located in the community uh, in um, Motor Row, historic Motor Row in the South Loop. I currently employ 10 people. Nine of them are architects. Four of them are licensed to practice in the state of Illinois, and two of them are lead accredited individuals. Um, we design spaces where people live, learn, work, and play. So housing, um, schools, usually K through 12. We have done some work in um, upper and uh, high for college uh, campuses, um, office buildings or office space, a lot of corporate office interior. And then play, we've done parks. We're currently working on DuSable Park. We did 31st Street Harbor, which was a lead award uh, sustainability project. Um, and so we'd just be really excited to uh, work with Mr. Mrs. Great Developer. <laughs> yes. So, Wonderful. Uh, that's Wonderful. our company in a nutshell. And this year, next year, we will be celebrating 30 years um, of providing service uh, to Chicago. That is amazing. I remember when you started the firm and, and your passion was radiant. And uh, I remember, <laughs> you know, when we were in college together, watching you study architecture, it was just, you know, I, I uh, admired you from afar, watching you uh, absorb what you needed to absorb. Well, so it, it's a great across fine. the board. So fine. let's dig a little bit deeper into what you're doing. Um, who would you say is your ideal client or what, what is your ideal project? You told us a little bit about 31st Street Harbor and how mm -hmm. you're dealing with uh, housing and office and a variety of asset classes. But who would you say is your ideal client? So I think um, when we look at a client, we really are looking for a client that one understands that they need an architect and why they need an architect. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think most people don't really know what architects do. Uh, and so the the challenge is making sure that we're on the same page about what services they need and what services we can actually provide. So you want a client that's knowledgeable about the process. They don't have to know everything, but they do need to have a big picture vision. They need to be funded. Mm -hmm. They need to have the money. Yes, yes. <laughs> they don't have to have, have it money. all in hand, but at least have access to it or know they need to get to it or, you know, the wherewithal to get there. Uh, site control is a great benefit. If not, if you don't have control of the site, at least control of the site is in your uh, uh, in your sites sometimes, mm -hmm. at least nearby. Um, a lot of times we are we are a part of the process of them gaining site control. Mm -hmm. um, so that's very important. Um, and then we just, again, knowing that our services are valued, that what we're bringing to the table is something that they're actually looking for. Um, and a lot of times, you know, for us, the, the, the boon is to do something in a community that we're active in. So we can actually yes. see work and we get to be uh, inter interface with the people that will that will use our product at the end of the day. Uh, sustainability is also something that um, is very important to us. Uh, so being able to design and develop a project that um, not only has a limited carbon footprint, but actually gives back to the environment mm. uh, in a very positive way. And then also, I really like projects where um, the end user is involved in the entire process. You know, right. sometimes we have had projects where 
uh, the developer is just kind of a buffer between us and the end user and they just tell us what they want. Mm -hmm. um, but when that when the end user is involved and we can talk to them and they can be a part of the design process, they just own it a lot more. They take a lot more. They have it, it, it has a great deal more value value to them. And we find that when we come back to those projects later, 5, 10, 15 years later, uh, they're well cared for because the community has embraced them. Mm hmm. Wonderful. And and you, you mentioned earlier that you're in the South Loop. We should mention because we have listeners all over the planet that you're in the South Loop of Chicago yes, and Motor sorry. Row, <laughs> uh, historic buildings there. And it's amazing seeing how that neighborhood has just progressed and gentrified since you've been there. It's uh, and I, I know you've been a part of that in different parts of Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we do see a lot more. Well, our last mayor of the previous administration um, made uh, a very, very conscious uh, and, and, and I won't just say intentional, but strong effort to drive development dollars uh, into the neighborhoods uh, because yes. for so very long, those dollars were being focused in in the, in the uh, central business district and on the north side. Um, but that administration developed a, a, a pretty robust program um, in making sure that those dollars were directed uh, in the south and west sides of, of, of Chicago. And so we've seen the benefit from that. Yes. And, and not only have you seen it, but you've also been instrumental in making it happen. There's, there's a quote from Alan Kay, the best way to predict the future is to make it. And so That's you're one of those making it. Yeah. I like that. That's yes, like yeah. be the change you want to see in the world, right? Yes, yes. So there you are. There you are. Now, you know what? There's something you said to me years ago. It may have been when your firm was only a year or two old. And it blows my mind. 30 years old. Isn't that amazing? Your your firm is 30 years old. Yeah. But, um, it is. It is. It's, <laughs> it's, it says, you know what it says? You're doing something right for your clients and they keep wanting to come back to you. Yeah, There's something so. that you told me about architecture and... After you told me this, I never looked at architecture the same. Uh -oh. You said that as an architect, you are responsible for creating a set of plans, and those plans are a legal document. Mm -hmm. That legal document says that if the construction company follows your plans to the letter, they will have a structure that will stand up, will stand the test of time, and it will be safe for any people who are in or around the structure. And I'm paraphrasing what you said a little bit, but that blew my mind. I never thought of architecture as preparing this legal document. You're using your design expertise, your structural engineering expertise. You're using your aesthetic expertise, all of these things. You're blending in that um, with lead and sustainability and some of the other things you mentioned. And that blows me away. My question for you is this. When did you start to look at architecture that way? And when did you get touch with the passion for architecture in, in, in that direction? You know, <laughs> that's a heavy question, right? <laughs> so I think for me, the discovery or the journey around architecture has been kind of like peeling back an onion, peeling the layers. Mm. Through. You know, I don't know if your, your audience knows this, but we attended the same high school and we were both required to take two years of drafting. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And drafting was my favorite class. Um, mm -hmm. I could stay in that class all periods of the of the day. Um, of course, I had to go to my other courses, but I literally when I'd get my <laughs> assignment at the beginning of the semester, I would finish them all like six weeks in and then I'd be sitting there looking at my teachers like, OK, now what? And I would What's just next? go around and, and, and then help everybody else in the class. Mm. But I, I knew I loved drawing. Now, I had mm -hmm. made a connect. I had not made a connection to buildings mm -hmm. or, or design or any of that. I just knew that I really loved to draft. Um, fortunately, our counselors found architecture programs and I ended up going to Notre Dame for a summer to get exposure to buildings and, and drawing. Cause I was also taking commercial art and physics and everything else, mm, but you know, it mm -hmm. didn't make sense to me. Um, I just knew I had to get good grades if I wanted to eat. Yes. <laughs> so, um, after graduation, I did you know, college for architecture and even then take design 
take studio or design studio, you're taking history, architecture, history classes, you're taking phys physics and structures and, and, and computer science and, and everything, but you don't really know how it comes together to create space. To create right. Community. So that was another layer that I, that I went through and learned. And then when you get out and you start practicing under architects, then you start putting together, you start to see how this whole process happens. Hmm. How you're meeting with uh, clients and getting an understanding of how they intend to use a space and how you can communicate what they said to you via bubble diagrams or floor plans, and then how that can converts into elevations and and uh, enlarge plans and details or sections and details and how that whole set has to come together and then be coordinated with a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, a plumbing engineer, a structural. And if it's a building, you got civil and, and landscape and so on, how you have to communicate and make sure that their drawings are saying what you said they would say, what your, yes. your client is expecting and how that whole set comes together. And then that book, that you created literally because it's a specification book and a book of drawings mm -hmm. is then issued to contractors who will look at that and read it and say, I can build that building for X amount of money. Um, and then us testing what they said to us, testing them and making sure they understood what we wrote or mm -hmm. what we said. And then making a recommendation to the client about, well, this contractor seems to have grasped the concept most wholly and can actually bring this drawing, bring this building or this space to fruition the way that we have discussed it. All of that is what you do when you work in a firm. And so mm -hmm. you would do that under an architect. I would say that when I went through my first project, when we had the big celebration, when all the drawings came together and we issued them for bid, was when I said, okay, now I get it. Yes. That wow. was, you know, 10 years. <laughs> so I have an undergraduate degree, I have a master's degree. So it was probably about eight years in the making before I really understood what this does, what, what we're really doing. And so you do that, you know, every year and because I, I started off in corporate office interiors. So mm -hmm. my projects would take about eight to nine months. Whereas if I were doing um, ground up construction, buildings, take about three years. Mm -hmm. so i got exposure to the whole cycle in eight to nine months whereas a lot of my counterparts who were just doing who were doing buildings it would take them three years to get exposure to that whole cycle the only thing was when i was doing interiors i didn't do site i wasn't building i didn't have any exposure to landscaping and site plan mm, right i was just doing the office the office interior um but still you learn the process you learn the process. And after you do it enough times, then you get and you've gotten enough exposure, then you can take the exam and you can become licensed to actually mm -hmm. practice on your own. So even after those eight years, when I finally understood it, I still couldn't do it on my own until I tested and was awarded a license by the state of Illinois, because what we do affects the life and safety of the general public. So we have to be licensed by the state to do it. Oh yes, that was a so, lot of time. So I'm gonna sit. <laughs> oh, go yeah, that, and that's that's fine. We uh, we encourage hydration here at ROI Clear. Certainly, okay. Thank you. Uh, we do encourage <laughs> hydration. Yeah, don't dry out uh, on us. Um, <laughs> so you said a lot there. Even after your you know your experience at Lynn Bloom, and you and I did go to the best high school in the history of high schools on the planet. The best high school. Go Eagles. In, go Eagles. Go Eagles. Lynn Bloom Technical <laughs> High School in Chicago. Um, even after high school and then your undergrad and then your graduate degree, all of that experience, then there's more experience you had to get. And then you were licensed. Mm -hmm. And then it, like all of that, all of those years, a decade of learning then clicked for you. That is truly <laughs> your, as uh, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell, well, before Malcolm Gladwell, Mal Malcolm Gladwell popularized this, the idea of getting 10,000 hours of practice before you can master something. You had much more than that 10,000 hours of practice. Yeah, but I didn't actually start practicing it in a holistic way until I started working. Mm. Prior to that, you were just kind of getting the ingredients. Yes. Right? But it wasn't until um, I was actually put into an office and we were doing the work that all of those ingredients were coming into 
the bowl and being mixed and, you know, so um, it, it does, you know, it's not, you know, we, it's a professional service. We're, we're not doctors, we're not attorneys, but we do provide a professional service mm -hmm. and it doesn't, it just doesn't happen overnight. You know, I don't know right. how many years doctors go to school and then they mm -hmm. have their internship and then they, they have their boards or mm -hmm. whatever it is that, 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 that has to take place when they say, okay, you can now practice. Attorneys have a three-year degree after college and then they sit for the bar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, architects, it's either a five-year or a four-two, which mine was a four-year undergrad, two-year master's. Mm -hmm. And then you have a two-year internship and then you can take the exam. So it's very similar. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it takes more than 10,000 hours. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And then there's the apprenticeship. Like it's not enough to just spend 10,000 hours. You also need to spend that time with someone okay. who knows what they're doing. So their knowledge can be passed on to you. Right. You have to practice under a licensed architect for either three to two, two to three years, I think. Um, and you have to get so many hours of exposure in certain areas. So when I took the exam some decades ago, there were nine parts to the exam. Mm -hmm. It took four days to take the exam. The first three days was an eight hour exam. So you got there at eight in the morning, you finished at five, four, something like that in the mm -hmm. afternoon. The last exam was for design where you were given 12 hours to design a building. Mm -hmm. Um. And so you're exposed to all of these different parts. So if I go through the layers of what it takes to build a building, there's a site. So we have to do, there's an exam that, that tests you on just the site. And so mm -hmm. you have to get so many hours of experience in site planning before you can take the exam. Then next is, you know, um, plant. Um, now it, it has changed. Now there were nine parts when I took it. I think now it's down to six or, or seven mm -hmm. or something like that. But you're basically going to get exposure to structure. You know, what are the structures that that actually hold the building up? You're going to get mm -hmm. exposed so many hours of exposure to practice management, like the the manage. Uh, what do I want to say? The project management of what it takes to get a building from conception, conceptual visualization to the actual building. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to have to get so many hours of exposure to design. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the other parts are. The uh, mechanical mm -hmm. and uh, the just the the um, environmental design of the building because you have to be concerned with how much natural light, <clears throat> what rooms are getting natural light, and so on. How much uh, natural ventilation is in the building? There's just a lot, but you know you get it's broken into those parts, and you get exposure to those parts while you're in your internship, and then you can take the exam. The exam is based upon those those um, those disciplines, I guess is what I would call it. Right. Multiple disciplines and you pull them all together. And then you touched on something that I, a, a path that I'd like to go down a little bit for um, for the, the next part of our time together, our discussion together. You touched on how the knowledge needs to be passed on from those who have experience to those who are new, the mentorship apprenticeship model. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you call it mentorship, apprenticeship explicitly in architecture, but there's certainly that pattern. Tell us about that. What was it like be becoming an apprentice? And then now you're a mentor to many right now. There's so many who look up to you, you know, um, including me. I'm I'm not an architect. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I don't know if I, this... It's not, you're right, it's not really called mentor apprentice mm -hmm. as much as you're called. When 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 I started, you were either an architect or an intern architect. Yes. That's it. And you were an intern architect until you passed the exam and then you were an architect. Got it. Uh, and so when you're in there working, you're working under an architect and whatever they need, you're doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yes, that, yes. Because as a team, we're all trying to get this ball across the finish line, right? Right, right. Um, and you're getting exposure to all of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so when they figure out a plan and they hand it to you and say, okay, I need you to dimension it, then you're learning how to dimension because you got to do it. I need you to put together this door schedule. 
you know, so now you know what it takes to make a door work, the hinges and, and the locks and, and everything, what makes it fire rated, what makes this door um, a double swing door, a mm -hmm. double and so on. So you, you learn all of that because you got to put those drawings together. Right. Uh, part of that process. I would say that a lot of times, yes, especially now in my, what I'm doing is um, we're making sure that our staff gets the exposure that they need so that they can take and pass the exam. Mm -hmm. So the woman in my office who had not done any site visits, she had never seen the, the space actually come into, she hadn't seen it constructed. Mm -hmm. She'd been doing drawings for two years, but she had never been out to the site. So wow. we have a project that's under construction. So I'm like, get her out there. And right. so she's there walking the site every week and she can see the progress and she understands, you know, those submittals and shop drawings that she's doing, how they translate into the space. From so, the paper to reality. Right, right. And that's all a part of it. You have to have site visits are a part of it. You have to have so many hours of site visits before you can take the exam. Yep. So when did you realize that you were a business leader? Um, <laughs> I think the weight of it, the reality of it, probably happened the first time we almost didn't make a payroll. Hmm. Because it was like, oh my God, I've got to give people bad news. But we mm -hmm. figured it out. But the prospect of not being able to make payroll and then all of the major hoops we had to jump through to make sure payroll happened. Yes. And then I never had that problem again. Right. Never had it again. But it was just the fear of knowing that, you know, there are people here who depend upon me for their health insurance, mm -hmm. for their children's health insurance, for their whole livelihood. Um, that uh, I have to take very seriously. Yes, indeed. Yeah, making payroll, that's a challenge. You know, you and I have both been down that path. It is, you you, you got to make it. You don't miss it. You don't okay. miss it. And then uh, we make sure the troops eat first and then, then we eat later, but we take care of the team first. That's so critical. Yeah. So what are some other things that you do to make sure that you are an effective leader because I got to tell you, I, you know, you were you were a client of mine years ago when I was running my technology company in Chicago, and one mm -hmm. of the things I used to watch you is the way you interacted with your team. You know, we're there doing the things that we did for you. Um, you know, my team was there doing uh, handling technology for you, and I always loved the way you interacted with your team. There was a very, um, you know, I knew there was a lot of stuff going on all around there, but in the midst of it, you all always ca carried a presence like a still forest pool, like a still lake in the, <laughs> middle of a, in the middle of a forest. And I know probably inside there's all kinds of stuff going on and you're thinking, oh, how do I do this? You know, there's gears turning all that stuff inside. But so what are some things that go into your thought process when you're leading the team, when you're building the company, when you're deciding which architects to hire, which structural engineers to work with, who to bring in, you know, which marketing people to bring in all of that. What are some thoughts that go through your head as you're building that team that is Brook Architecture? I think for us, it's just passion for or enjoying what you do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be looking for your why. And there needs to be joy in that. Um, I think we, we hire people who want to help who want to make the world a better place. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we're all working together to make that happen. Um, nobody is perfect. No one knows everything. And we just try and keep the, the goal, a big picture goal, mm -hmm. so we don't get caught up in the minutia and just focus on that. You know, right. mistakes happen. As long as this is what, <laughs> there is a guy I, um, I'm a part of a cycling club here in Chicago and mm -hmm. we all, you know, at the end of the day, some people are just, they just, you know, there's a lot of complaining about, oh my God, that was so hard. It was this, this, it was that, it was this, it was that. And <laughs> at the end of the day, they'll ask the question, but did you die? 
Oh, you didn't. All right, then let's keep going. <laughs> yeah, get over it. You're alive. Get over it. Keep going. Yeah. Wow. So that's kind of how we look at it. Like, but did you die? All right. Yes. Let's keep it going. <laughs> yes. So. I love that. I love that. We're coming towards the end of our time together. This has gone really, really quickly. It, it's did. amazing. So there, there are a few things I'll, I'll do to wrap up. What is it that you're reading or what is it that you're listening to to, uh, to build your skills and, and to continue to improve Ramona Westbrook? I just started this book that everybody's been talking about, How to Win Friends and Influence. Is it Enemies? Influence People. Yes, Influence People, yes. And it's By so Dale Carnegie, that one? Yes. Yes, I all right. Kind of listening. I mean, everyone has been talking about it since forever, and I've, I've had it in my audiobook collect library for a while, and I've been trying to listen less to books that keep me up at night. Yeah. <laughs> Even, um, but, you know, sometimes it just, um, I think the books I've been listening to prior to that have had to do a lot with health um, mm -hmm. and just managing stress and so on. And I was like, you know, I got to get back to the business. And we're at a place where I'm really, I really am very pleased with my team. I'm very happy. Mm that we have um, that are working for us. Um, and as I said, we'll be celebrating 30 years next year. So I'm really thinking about legacy and yes. uh, how I pass this on to them. Right. Um, and one of the, I think we've got most, you know, in a business you've got uh, uh, finance and um, human resources and you've got operations and then you've got marketing. Um, right. I think operations are pretty solid. I think our finance is pretty solid. Our human resources is kind of natural, but mm -hmm. you know, we still need to probably uh, codify our approaches, or our systems to that. And marketing is the one thing that is just not architects. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's the thing that you yes. really have to like <laughs> train and talk about and think through. And so I said, you know, I really need to um, get a bit more serious about marketing for us so that I can pass it on in mm -hmm. a structured manner because right now it's very organic it tends to be all about me i need it to be less about me and more about more about my team so mm -hmm. i said let me listen to this book uh and get a, a better understanding of how to win friends and how to influence people and that and i think that for our marketing purposes at any rate you know we've got the skill we've got the experience but more than anything it's relationships so just understanding that and helping my team understand that is, is pretty important to me right now Wonderful. You know what? I got to say, uh, in the 100 plus interviews that we've done, you're the first person to recommend that book. But it's so appropriate because it's a classic and it is so necessary if you want to be an effective business leader or an effective entrepreneur. So, yeah. And when I'm listening to it, I'm, he's yes. talking about events. And I'm like, man, these events took place when my mom was a kid. Yes. Yeah. Like, oh, 1930s, 1940s. That's what he's talking about. But it's so. The guy who's narrating it sounds like it just happened yesterday. Yes. Yeah. So it, it, it just calls attention to the fact that the things, the more things change, the more they really are the same. So um, true. And we can learn so much from the past. So true. So true. Ramona Westbrook, how can people get in touch with you? If they want to reach out to you or your team at Brook Architecture, how can they reach you? Well, however you like. We have, um, you can always call us. Uh, that's 312-528-0890. You can always reach out to us via email. Um, you can reach out to me at rwestbrook at brookarchitecture.com and then info at brookarchitecture.com. And uh, we're on social media. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. Not on, uh, what's the other one? Twitter? No, we're not on that. But okay. the other three we are on. So you can yes. reach and then our website, www.brookarchitecture.com. Wonderful. We'll make sure we include links to those in our show notes. Sure. Ramona Westbrook, it has truly been an honor having you here on the ROI Clear podcast. Thank you for having me, Raymond. It has truly been an honor to be here, <laughs> especially <laughs> with you, my friend, especially <laughs> with you. <laughs> oh, boy. You're all right. Oh, 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 oh,